basically my project is about uh, providing different low cost solutions for neurological disorders using machine learning. And so what I really wanted to start off with is innovation in general. So behind every single innovation lies a story, a process for why and how something has come into fruition. And sometimes it's just a simple question, like what would happen in this scenario? Or how does this particular thing work? And other times it's also just a situation that plants the seed of a new idea. And I've had a lot of such instances in my life as a student researcher, and I really wanted to share one particular story about the power of innovation and how it can really be used to improve countless lives. So I've always loved science and STEM growing up, and I always loved asking really big questions, like why things work the way they do, or how could I make something better? And this inherent curiosity really uh, continued throughout my high school career and prompted me to start conducting research on my own. So last summer, I interned at a lab where I helped researchers develop a new potential treatment for ALS. And it was a very complex but very beautiful process of experimentation and coming up with new ideas, but one question always remained. So it's one thing to create a treatment for ALS, but how do we diagnose this disease earlier in patients? And so this question really prompted me to conduct a lot more research independently, where I found that AL patients with ALS are not only diagnosed in the later stages of the disease, but they also face a lot of communication issues that negatively impacted their quality of life. And so now I was left with one question that I really wanted to answer. How do I create a system to diagnose ALS earlier in patients, but also improve their general quality of life? And so this is where the hard work began. So as I started conducting a lot of background research, I saw that one of the easiest and uh, earliest telltale signs for ALS, as well as other neurological disorders, is a condition called dysarthria. And dysarthria basically means that patients have certain difficulties saying certain words and phrases, or also speak in a different pitch or tempo, harmonicity, frequency, etc., than how they normally speak. So this important discovery really helped me realize that if I could create a system that uses the way the patients say certain words and phrases as a way to potentially diagnose ALS, but also other neurological disorders, that way I can also help improve not only the earlier diagnosis issue, but also maybe improve the overall quality of life issue as well. So to actually create this particular system, I relied on various methods to actually analyze auditory data. So first, I wanted to first prove that this particular hypothesis that I had was actually correct. So I use a bunch of public data sets um, that contain audio files from patients with and without a, a, um, ALS, and basically passed these through different softwares that extracted 26 or so auditory features, including things like pitch, tempo, harmonicity, frequency at which a patient is speaking, et cetera. And so this particular software basically generated a bunch of different number values for each of these auditory features. So when these numbers were passed through different machine learning algorithms, it would establish certain thresholds for these features. So for example, if a patient were to speak uh, consistently at a rate of about 15, right, some uh, number value passed through through this particular software, then this patient will probably be considered to have ALS. So when I was analyzing all the different uh, data needed for these different values, I saw that there were three key auditory features that were really distinct in ALS patients when compared to baseline files. And these three auditory features were tempo, pitch, as well as loudness. So typically, ALS patients speak at a slower tempo and a much higher pitch and a softer volume in comparison to patients without certain neurological disorders. So theoretically, by looking at these different threshold values for these three auditory features over a consistent and long period of time, doctors would be able to diagnose patients earlier. And so I wanted to make sure that these auditory features were really the same, regardless of the analysis performed. So I wanted to try more than one method of analyzing a patient's voice. And so that's where the secondary analysis method comes into play, called MEL frequency analysis. So basically what MEL frequency analysis does is it converts certain words that patients say, for example, SIP or PAP into different images that consist of different colors and different features depending on the way they say certain words and phrases. And they take into it takes into consideration the tempo at which a pa uh, patient is speaking, or the pitch or the harmonicity at which the patient is speaking, and generates an image as a result. 
So essentially, the algorithm creates an image for each of these different words that is said by a particular patient. And these images are then passed through a machine learning algorithm, which yielded a classification accuracy in about the mid 80s. But I really wanted to make sure that the classification accuracy was as high as possible. So I created this thing called a stacked machine learning model. So essentially what a stacked machine learning model does is it takes the best features of all sorts of different um, machine learning algorithms, including neural networks and logistic regressions and so on, to essentially create a new and improved hybrid model. So when I basically take, um, took all of these images as well as the voice files and passed it through a stacked machine learning model, I thought that the accuracy significantly improved to about the mid 90s. So about a, a five to 10, as well as even a 10% increase in some instances as well. But now I wanted to focus on the second part of this project, improving the overall quality of life for patients with ALS. So when I previously did research about the quality of life for patients with ALS and other neurological disorders, I saw that a lot of these patients relied on technology known as ASRs, or automated speech recognition softwares. And they're things like Siri or Amazon Alexa or Google Voice, basically helping these patients complete daily tasks. For example, checking the email or checking the weather outside. However, as, the, um, as these diseases progressively get worse, such devices are no longer able to recognize the commands that these patients basically tell them, making their lives a lot harder than it needs to be. So essentially, now that I was able to really recognize the key auditory biomarkers per se that were heavily impacted as a result of ALS, I would have to adjust these particular factors to make them as similar to their baseline voice as possible in order for these ASRs to better recognize a patient's commands and better, um, you know, cater to their needs. So as this and so this particular process was really threefold. So I really had to first adjust the tempo to make the voices speak faster in a way. So the way I did this was I basically stacked millisecond layers of the recording on top of one another to essentially shorten the length of time for the recording. The second, the second step that I had to take was essentially to adjust the pitch by multiplying it by some sort of scalar value that was less than one in order to make the pitch a lot lower because patients with ALS tend to speak at a much higher pitch than normal. Similarly, the third and the final step was to adjust the loudness by essentially making, by multiplying it by another scalar value that in this case was greater than one in order to increase the loudness at which these ALS patients speak. And so with these particular changes, the overall recognition rate improved from 15, uh, from 15 to about 60% as well. And the reason for this particular range is primarily because the extent of ALS for different patients was varied throughout all the different test subjects. So patients in the lower part of the range, closer to 15% improvements, did not have higher degrees of ALS when compared to the patients in the higher end of that range or at about 60%. So next, the final step was ensuring that this earlier diagnosis and improving the quality of life would actually work for all sorts of neurological disorders. So I wanted to basically prove this particular concept by providing data with Parkinson's disease. So when I basically found the public data set that contained a lot of Parkinson's disease data and put it into a bunch of these different models, I found very similar results. So patients with Parkinson's had the same auditory biomarkers, but the threshold for these features were a lot different in compared to ALS. So therefore, it basically proves the initial hypothesis that these auditory features and the extent to which they change are really depending on the neurological disorder, essentially proving the entire fact that yes, you theoretically can use a patient's voice and establish these particular auditory biomarkers to one, not only allow for earlier diagnosis of a particular disease, but two, also improving the overall quality of life by adjusting their voice in order to allow ASRs to better recognize and cater to their needs. So this entire project essentially proves that it is possible to diagnose different neurological disorders earlier in patients and to really improve the general quality of life that these patients will live just by using simple technologies. And so my story is just, again, one of countless of other stories about the power of innovation in our society. And it just goes to show you that innovation just takes so many different forms. And again, curiosity drives innovation. So all you have to do is just keep asking questions about the world. And as a result, you might just be able to help millions of people around the world as well. Thank you.